He said, well, I always wanted to be the guy who could, like, you know, take the woman off into the horizon. <laughs> that sounded kind of corny. <laughs> I'm on a panel with him, right? So, you know, I'm not the only one looking at him. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then I get this flashback of my mother in the kitchen, and she ain't seen the horizon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my mother rolled off with my father. So that's another story. I can leave your mother and be like everyone else, my father says to me during a commercial. It doesn't matter how old I am. His words will find a place in the cup of my pants, in the corner of my coat pocket, or as I turn a corner on a cold winter afternoon and turn my collar up against the wind. My father is blowing down my neck like Coleman Hawkins. And someone says, a hawk is blowing. And the notes from my father's life are rushing at me. And the compositions as complex as anything Thelonious Monk could imagine. Yes, Rudy, really, my dear. Two bodies in the dark, one talking and the other listening to a strange sound coming from where pain and hurt is mixed with depression and the blues. And if you cry for everyone and not just yourself, this is where you discover the middle passage, the Holocaust, the plantation, the concentration camps, the bombing of cities and whatever is left. This is a how Allen Ginsberg described for an entire generation. That spoken and spokenness, those moments between father and son that are not the simplicity of playing catch with a ball and glove. It's a moment when your father lets you touch the nakedness of his back, the place where the weight of his own sex and identity meets your own. And the mirror you're afraid to look into is the face of your own father. And this is also the face of history. <clears throat> So I have this line in here about playing catch with a ball of glove. So um, as I said, I was going to read um, some baseball poems. And um, because um, actually Radcliffe played baseball, he was better than I did. You know, so he, you know I just wanted to be a member of the New York Yankees. She had to go. She always told me she had to know from home. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so we know where she's going. Um, so these are, these are three poems about baseball, and you can see um, uh, what I'm doing with baseball. So the same thing I was doing with Slate, switching things around. Uh, this is called Rain Delay. And this is all from a book that comes out February of next year called If God Invented Baseball. Rain Delay. The rain stops in midair, like Satchel Paige throwing his hesitation pitch or the Supreme Court deciding it's all deliberate speed when it comes to integration. Segregation was America's dark cloud, the mud stain on white uniforms. The scoreboard a reminder that waiting was a wasted turn at bat. The rain continues to fall in one direction. Who can say this is progress? And this is Jackie Robinson, short poem. After baseball, his hair turned gray, as if someone had placed a tarp over the field. Read that one more time. Jackie Robinson. After baseball, his hair turned gray, as if someone had placed a tarp over the field. I look at, Jackie Robinson died very young, you know, and um, I always look at Jackie Robinson after baseball. I look at Obama, you know, the gray of the hair. Um, and, you know, these movies come out like 42 and this great experiment. And what we tie into is what Jackie Robinson had to go through. And Jackie Robinson had a temper. He didn't check wrong with it. Jackie Robinson had a temper. Not just banging a bag, uh, you know, against a, a dugout wall. He had a temper. In fact, that's why he was almost caught marching when he was in the Army in Texas. But that's another story, Jackie Robinson's story. But he had a temper. But it was an interesting thing. After. The great experiment was successful. Brandon Ricky said, okay, well, you know, you proved. But Jackie Robinson got in nothing but fights. <laughs> Jackie Robinson got in fights with Roy Campanella, got with his teammates. He had a temper. He got in arguments with, with sports writers. You know, he let, he had this real bad temper. And, you know, he's not that quiet Jackie Robinson. Now, the person who kept him in check, and you don't have any Jackie Robinson. Unless you have Rachel Robinson. Yeah. Okay. Buzzy Pervasi, who went to, up to Canada, I think to Montreal, just before to see whether Jackie was ready to come to the Brooklyn Dodgers, he got to the ballpark and he said, I sat next to Rachel Robinson. I didn't have to talk to Jackie. Okay. 
Uh, and, and that just says a lot about, you know, before Michelle and Obama, you know, Barack, there was Rachel and Jackie. You know what I mean? That, that's a love couple that, for, for the agents, because of what they had to go through. But I looked at this whole thing of how Jackie Robinson's hair turned grad, you know, and just the stress that was there, uh, and they died young. This is Poomsie Green. I, took, I take my poems into different places, like I'm in the gallery, I go into prison. I was in a senior citizen home, Sunrise, uh, on Connecticut Avenue, and there was a Red Sox fan guy, the old guy. He's a, you know, Red Sox fans are always old guys, you know? <laughs> 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 the, 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 the Red Sox fans, you know, I mean, if, if, if you want to experience anything, to understand baseball, and I haven't been to St. Louis yet, but if you are in Boston, like, opening day, you know, it's like the Pope has arrived. You know what I mean? Yeah, everything starts. I mean, it's, it's really a thing where you talk about, or that you can discover the love of the game. You know, but it's, it's, it's key. I guess it's like football in Green Bay. <clears throat> but this is a thing where Pumpsy Green, if you know baseball history, he was the first, um, well, Boston Red Sox was the last team to integrate, and Pumpsy Green was the first, their first player. Pumpsy Green. Years before we decided to change our names and name ourselves, I held your baseball card in black hands and wondered who gave you the name Poopsie. How unforgettable, as if Nat King Cole had decided to sing your name. You were the first black player to play for Boston. I wondered about the ear's loneliness when you got a hit or the error someone made when calling you to bunt and run. How green was the Fenway field before your arrival? Your name, a sign against segregation, finally finding a place in the locker room. Poopsie Green. What Red Sox fan mistook your last name for being Irish <laughs> after being puzzled by your first? <laughs> and um, I'll end with this poem, then we, we can have some questions and conversation. Um, you know, going back to Radcliffe and, and, and the work here, uh, another key word uh, is, is memory. And um, one of the things that um, is affecting many of us, and it's definitely affecting me, is that we have loved ones in our household who are suffering from memory loss, you know, all times. And um, I just recently relocated my sister, who's five years older than I am, uh, from Yonkers to Hyattsville, so that I'm closer to her. Um, but it's a thing in terms of seeing my sister more than I was seeing her when she was in Yonkers. I would see my sister like maybe once or twice a year. But now because she's closer, uh, I try to see her like maybe twice or three times a week. And being a writer and writing memoirs, uh, and I have to say this, this following words that I read from, one of the things in terms of structure, I wrote my memoir in two voices, my voice and my sister's voice. Uh, I did that because in my household, I was the baby of the family. And I always tell people, I thought my name was you know, when the baby gets in the door, like, shh, like you're not supposed to hear it. <laughs> you know, so you go, shh. <laughs> so when I was writing my memoir, I realized there was so many things about my family I didn't know. And the same way I gave back to the bigger family, so much stuff about slavery that we don't know. And so we always have to go back and tell that story. And so um, I had my sister's voice, and I created and she loves this book. Now I'm looking at a concept of erasure because she's losing, which, you know, She's, um, I would guess by next year, uh, this time, I wonder whether she'll recognize me. You know, because right now she's having problems with my, the day she was born. You know, so I see this sort of empty ratio. And now I ask myself, OK, what should be my responsibility as a writer now? I, mean, I wrote it maybe because there were things I didn't know. And so I created her voice. But now, do I have, am I the one that should document her life? And the thing which I'm messing with is when you have a family member that sometimes dies or you take care of, you discover things that like you have a power attorney or all of a sudden somebody dies and you clean out the apartments and stuff. Like for example now, because I had to move my sister, I have all the things that my sister had from my mother. Okay? So, you know, now I know where I was born. <laughs> you, know? you know, see all those things which I didn't know. Um, and the question now is that what of my sister's life as a writer should I document? And one of the things I came across is that my sister was in a very, very, very abusive marriage, which I didn't know anything about. 
you know, and the only thing I could think of is that my mother kept her in a bad marriage. The whole thing of being like Catholic, <laughs> you know, you don't get the voice. And, and everything's written in Latin. I hope that's true. <laughs> but what happened is that now that I have that, I'm looking at these documents just like I was in a library. What do I do with that? And part of me is like, okay, this is what I do. Okay? She can't tell her story. And I feel like, you know, this is a, a personal holocaust or whatever she experienced. I have to do something about it. And so this is a poem I wrote for her. Uh, it's called Passover for Marie. You open the door and find your sister sitting on her bed. The darkness of the room resting on her shoulders darker than the past. 